Lauren Jones. I am a deacon here at Mercy View. Today we will be reading from 1 Samuel 3, uh, verses 1 through 4, the beginning of verse 1. So these pages can be, these verses can be found on page 130 in the blue Bibles underneath your chairs. If you don't have one, we would love for you to take one, be our gift to you. So we'll start in 1 Samuel 3, verse 1. Now the young Now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time Eli, whose sight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of the God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went down. He went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his own place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end, and I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever. For the iniquity he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever." Samuel lay until morning. He opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Good to see you. Welcome to Mercy View. If you are visiting with us this morning, honored you're here. Um, I hope you've been blessed by your time with us so far. Um, Would love to meet you if I haven't had a chance to. Hey, real quick, one more housekeeping uh, note. Wanted to get everybody in the room on this one. Um, we are so glad to be able to provide coffee for you, and I know many of you take advantage of that. The church that we are sharing space with has asked us if when you're done drinking your coffee and there's still some coffee left in your cup, to pour it in the water fountain or the bathroom sinks. Fair? Good? Okay, so uh, just drink it all. It won't be a problem, but if you do have some left over... Those are the places to dump. We don't want to put any more uh, drinks that have liquid in them in this front uh, trash can. It's getting kind of messy. Okay. Um, probably if someone says to you, are you listening to me? It, it means you're not listening to them, right? 
If, if, if someone like says, hey, uh, are you listening to what I'm talking about here, what I'm trying to say to you? Uh, it, it most likely means the odds are that, that, that uh, you haven't been listening. Um, I know this happens often in our home. I'm a, a, a absolutely the culprit on this. Often I'm focused in on something and Holly or the kids are trying to get my attention to, to ask me a question or to tell me something that's really important to them. Um, I admit I, I, this happens often uh, for me. And I, I really have to be more aware of myself and, 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 and what is going on in those moments or... I will send the message to Holly and the kids that I don't really care, not only about what they're talking about, but actually don't care about them. Because if they're telling me something that's important to them, to me, it's something like that I need to be paying attention to. And it actually communicates, just in listening well, that I care uh, about them. And, and you guys know this, when you're not listening and someone asks that question, are you listening to me, and you realize you're not listening well, it can go from bad to worse really quickly. All right, um, I have to, and this is what we say in our family, um, turn on our ears, right? I can think of, of times with the kiddos where we're trying to tell them to do something, they don't do it, and then we say, I told you to do this, did you not hear me? And they would say, no, I didn't hear you at all, Dad. You know, and we'll say, well, turn on your ears. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. This is what Samuel says in our story today, and he was, unlike we are many times, ready to listen. He was ready to hear God's voice. God, in coming to Samuel, didn't have to wonder if Samuel would be listening. But not only that, Samuel was not just hearing to hear, he was hearing to obey. He was ready to have his ears open and then to whatever the Lord asked him to do to walk in obedience and whatever that, that looked like. So the question that this reminds me of this morning, and this is a, you know, I was kind of joking with, we have a, a pre-service huddle here and before church to walk through the service with the worship team, everybody that's really participating in worship. And this kind of feels like a, a youth camp question um, but this is one that I think we would do well to actually wrestle with this morning. This is the theme of what we need to chat about, really. And it's this. Are your ears open to hearing from the Lord? Are they open? And if not, why do we struggle so much with hearing from God? Or why do we sometimes think we've heard something from God? It's not from God. It's just our, you know, what we eat for lunch. It's a bad kind of feeling in our, our God. And I actually wonder this too. I actually think that it's not so much maybe that we struggle to hear from God. It's, it's we've heard from him. We know what he's calling us to do. Again, it could be something very grand. It could be something very small. But in, in, in his way, he prompts us to act in a certain way, but we aren't willing to follow him in obedience in the thing that we've heard from him on. Why do we resist that, that call in our lives? We are in a sermon series in the book of 1 Samuel called In Search of a King, and what we're really doing in this book is looking at uh, the story of God's people. And the story of God's people is complicated. And in the book of 1 Samuel, we are entering into a, a, a point in the story where the worship of God has been defamed and dishonored because the leadership of the church, the priests, have um, taken advantage of people. And um, we're going to see in the story today that in the tabernacle itself, there's a thing that uh, is lit called a lampstand, and it's just about to go out. And that is a problem for God's people because that would mean that God's presence has left his people. 
And we're in the first part of the book of 1 Samuel where we're looking at the, 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 the person, the character who this book is named after, the, 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 the man named Samuel. And, and at this point in our story, Samuel is believed to be a, a teenager, maybe a young adult, maybe even 20 years old. And even today, we're going to see really what the big theme of this whole book is, is that God continues to work out his sovereign purposes in the world according to his will, sometimes in spite of sinful people and many times through imperfect people. And so as we look at our passage today, I really just want to invite you to see one thing, and it's this. When we hear the word of God... We are called to obey the God of the Word. When we hear the Word of God, we are called to obey the God of the Word. Now, at this point in the story of God's people in our book here, they are in need of two things. Um, The first is this. They need a new leader. Someone who will righteously lead the people in worship and guard the gate unlike Eli and his sons did. Someone who will stand in the gap to recover the righteous worship of God until a new priest can be installed. But second, in the next chapter, we're going to see this in 1 Samuel 4, the Ark of the Covenant is going to be captured and taken out of the tabernacle for 20 years. And in its absence, God's people are going to need someone to bring the word of God to them. And that was what the priest in the tabernacle did. But now there's no priests, the ark's been taken out of the tabernacle, and someone is going to need to be a substitute oracle to carry the word of God to the people of God where they are. So that is where we find ourselves today. And so if you have your Bibles or electronic devices, keep them open to 1 Samuel 3. Just right there in verse 1 is where we're going to start. Here we see Samuel ministering in the temple, performing priestly duties. You'll notice that it says that that God wasn't coming to talk to the people of God very often, if at all. There was no vision for the future at this time. And if you move to verse 2, you'll notice that the writer for Samuel says that the priest, Eli, who again at this point he's getting up in age, he's likely in his 80s, most believe he's semi-retired, his sons, um, Hophni and Phinehas, are the ones who are really the the priest or acting as priests. We know that they're not doing a good job with that work. But you notice that it says that Eli's vision or his eyesight had begun to grow dim. And this is just a reality for us, friends. Like whenever our eyes are growing dim, we're not listening or seeing the Lord like we should. There, There won't be vision for us. In our lives. The vision for Israel, God's people here, is growing dim as well. Now, some of, I'm sure, what Eli's eyesight issues were, were related to age, but I want you to note something here. In the Bible, blindness typically comes as a consequence of sin. And while that is in the mix here, I think, for for Eli, we've seen his sin on full display the last couple of weeks. His dim eyesight is more here about his moral blindness. And not only that, as the one who is representing the, 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 the people of God here, it's really also represent, re- representing the, the place where the morality is at in the nation as well. The blindness that exists in the nation of Israel. Another commentator said this in much the same way, that this dimness symbolized just how morally blind Eli was because his son's sins were on a high beam. All right, we saw that the last couple weeks. Yet, even though his son's sins are on high beam, Eli is choosing to close his eyes so much so that their sins seemed manageable or tameable. Now it says in verse 3 that we, we just said this, that the lampstand has not gone out. This is one of the most significant verses in the first part of this book. Because the tabernacle itself 
was a symbol of the world. It represented the world that the people of God lived in at that time. And the lampstand that was in the tabernacle was a symbol of God's light to shine upon God's world. That all took place in the this spot in the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And, and we, we've seen the depth and depravity that has been taking place in the nation of, of Israel over the last couple of chapters. Yet somehow, in the midst of all of that, the lampstand in the tabernacle is still burning. It's faint, it's weak, but it's still flickering. Let's think about it this way. If God wanted to render judgment, he could have let the lampstand go out. He could have let Eli die and leave the nation of Israel to themselves, and he would have been completely justified in doing so. But the flame of God, the light of God, is still flickering for a reason. So Samuel is lying there, and it says in the temple, you'll see that word, and it might strike you as odd because we've been talking about the tabernacle, and all of a sudden the writer changes to the word here. He calls it the, the temple, and here's why. By this time, the tabernacle, the original tabernacle, had been in the same spot for a long time there in Shiloh. And over time, what happened, and you can imagine this if you had a space like this, you're making improvements as you go along, and it basically was changing from a tabernacle to a temple. And so when it says that Samuel was lying where the ark was, it doesn't mean necessarily that he was in the actual place where the ark was, which was the Holy of Holies. He would have actually not been allowed to be in there. He wasn't a priest. It means that he was sleeping on the temple grounds. And, and so here is Samuel lying down, trying to get some sleep. And there in verse 4, he hears something. He hears the audible voice of God. And Samuel, thinking it's Eli, says, here I am. He, he runs to Eli and says, was that you? It's, I, I'm here, uh, Eli, what do you need? But Eli tells Samuel it wasn't him. Verse 6, God calls Samuel again. Samuel thinks it's Eli. Eli says it's not him once again. And then verse 7, it says something very interesting. It says that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Now Samuel knew the Lord, I believe, in a spiritual sense. He's in the temple. He's not only performing priestly duties, but he's worshiping God. He is, is praying to God in, in the tabernacle. But what this means here is that up until this point, he did not know God in an official sense. And, and here's what that means. God had not yet called Samuel to be a prophet. Here, here is what is happening. God is revealing himself to Samuel in an audible way to establish him as a prophet. So don't miss what is happening here. We are witnessing right now in this passage, Samuel being called to the office of prophet through the divine call of God. This is no small thing. Now verse 8, God calls Samuel for a third time. But this time when, when Samuel approaches Eli, Eli is beginning to discern something. He is sensing that it is actually the Lord who is talking to Samuel, calling Samuel. And sensing that, Eli tells Samuel to lie down and if the Lord comes again, to tell God to speak to Samuel. And so in verse 10, God does that and a little more. God not only comes to Samuel and speaks to him, but he appears to him. In verse 10, he becomes a visible manifestation to Samuel. A, a tangible, like something in human form that Samuel would have seen with his own eyes. This is what you call, you see this in the Old Testament from time to time, a theophany. And here, here's what is amazing. If this is the visible glory of God, he is coming down from the mercy seat which sat atop of the Ark of the Covenant 
and talking to Samuel as if to say, you are now going to be in charge here. Whenever the ark gets taken from the tabernacle next week, I think it's next week, it's gone for 20 years. And in those 20 years, Samuel is the one who's going to serve as a bridge for the nation of Israel to help them hear, understand, and live out the word of God. Now look with me if you would at verse 11. Let me just read that again. It's a significant verse. Here's what it says. Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And on that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Again, remember what this is. This is God speaking to Samuel. Um, This is God reiterating his warning of judgment that we saw last week. And as Samuel here is being... uh, appointed as an official prophet, this is the first word that God is giving Samuel. He's saying, your first job as a prophet is to go to Eli and remind him of the severe judgment that I have against him and his house. And he, he says, this will make the, the people who hear of it like what happens, the, 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 the end result of the judgment, it will make people's ears tingle. Here's why. Remember that the story of 1 Samuel, we said this in the introduction uh, of our book, it's happening right at the end of the time of the judges. And as bad as it got in the period of the judges, some point we're going to uh, preach through the book of Judges, it will be difficult. But as, as bad as it was in the time of the judges, the ark was never captured. And the priests were never judged or killed. That's how bad things are right now. But I don't want you to miss what's happening too in this moment. This boy, this teenager, God is coming to him in the middle of the night appointing him as the new prophet of Israel, declaring a prophecy that he is going to punish someone, but not just anyone. He's going to punish his surrogate family. He's going to punish Eli's house for their grievous sins against him. Think of the weight of this. This is Samuel's mentor. This is his surrogate father. Surely Samuel must have wished that he could tell Eli that God would atone for his sins and his son's sins. What Samuel is bringing to Eli here was a judgment for despising God's mercy. Right? The sacrificial system that was in place at this time was meant to highlight God's mercy, to receive God's mercy. And yet he and his sons defamed it and thus despise God's mercy through it. The very thing that it symbolized, mercy, was being taken away from Eli. It was a grave moment with far-reaching implications for a teenager to say to his mentor. So verse 15. The morning comes, and Samuel approaches Eli in the tabernacle to tell him what God had said to him. And notice it said that Samuel was afraid. I'd be afraid, wouldn't you? But just like we said, as well, Samuel isn't just hearing to hear, right? He's hearing to obey. And so, with courage, he goes to his mentor and his surrogate father to remind him of the severe judgment that is going to fall on him and his house. It's interesting, you can kind of see this in this part of the passage. It seems as if Eli wanted to know God's word to Samuel, which was ultimately to him. So much so that he makes an oath there in in verse 17. That's what those words are about there. And In other words, there is a hint here that he senses that the words that God spoke to Samuel may not be bad news. You've ever been with someone, they say, I have bad news or good news, you know, or I have bad news and good news. You say, what do you want first? 
It's almost if Eli knew there's no good news here. Just give me the bad news, right? He had already heard the bad news, by the way, from the man of God last week in 1 Samuel 2. And so in this moment, he is likely fearing that Samuel was here to confirm it, which he was. And we see in verse 18 that Samuel told him everything and left nothing out. Now, I want you to notice Eli's response. It's there at the end of verse 18. It's pretty unimpressive. Why is it unimpressive, though? Because it contains no repentance. The irony of this moment is that through the prophecy that Samuel is bringing to Eli, it's as if God is giving him, Eli, one more shot to repent. But Eli seems resigned to the fact that this judgment is just going to happen. If he would have repented, and I think there was still a shot here for him to do that, everything would have changed. Think about it this way. If God wanted to destroy Eli, he would have given him no warning. The fact that the word of God came to him one more time here was an opportunity for him to repent, but he forfeited the moment. Like Eli's words have kind of a religious ring to them. It's almost as if he is, it sounds like he's submitting to God in a way. But really what he is doing here, it's fatalism couched in some religious terms. Now as we look at the final verses of this passage, we see that the Lord continued to reveal information to Samuel for him to speak to others, namely Israel. And, and if you look at verse 1 of 1 Samuel 4, you'll see that the word of God would come through Samuel to all of Israel. In short, Samuel was a prophet to the nation of Israel. That's what's significant in our story today. Here's how theologian and pastor Peter Lightheart says it. He says, because Samuel received the word that is light, Samuel was himself a flickering wick that kept the knowledge of God alive during a dark period. So long as God was speaking to Samuel, the full darkness of the dark age had not yet arrived. You could really say it this way. Samuel was the first prophet in Israel since Moses. And like Moses, Samuel the prophet was God's instrument to help form the future of a new era of Israel's history. People would come to respect that Samuel represented the Lord. Because, as we see here in these last few verses of this passage, every message that he would deliver would be just as the Lord, like what happened would be just, that's what the Lord said. Like, here's what the Lord has to say, and that would happen. All right? And it was a moment to be reminded, like for God's people, the silence was broken. God is speaking once again. Now, one of the key themes, I think, of, of the past couple of weeks has been this idea of hearing, right? Eli heard reports of his sons in 1 Samuel 2, bad reports, and he sort of scolds his sons, but he doesn't remove them from leadership, which is what integrity would have called for. Today, Samuel hears the Lord speak, even when Eli didn't. Samuel listened where Hophni and Phinehas closed their ears. And just as the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not repent, the Lord was hardening the hearts of the priests in this time in order to prepare a new exodus. There actually might be a connection between the name of Samuel and the Hebrew verb hear. And Samuel might be a play on the phrase God hears. A sign that it was through Samuel that the Lord was raising up a new Israel to hear the word of the Lord and to worship and to honor him rightly. Samuel heard the Lord and he obeyed the Lord. Do you remember that little phrase that Samuel repeated when he approached Eli after hearing the word of God come to him? Each time that the Lord spoke to him, Samuel came to Eli and said three words. 
here I am. Now, what is interesting here is that what we see in the obedience of Samuel bringing the prophecy of judgment to Eli was that he was in effect saying to God, here I am. How else would he have had the courage to bring this bad news to a surrogate father? Well, he was more concerned about honoring his heavenly father who had come to him and called him to the work of God rather than the approval of his mentor. Right, are you with me? He was making himself available to what God wanted, whatever that was. And in this instance, it was a severe word for someone who had helped raise him. And that brings me to the one thing I want to invite you to see this morning. When we hear the word of God, we are called to obey the God of that word. When we hear the, the word of God, when God speaks to us, sometimes it's a still small voice, sometimes it's a megaphone. We are called, like Samuel, to obey in faith, the God of that word. There are a couple things that I, I want us to think about here as we think about this idea, like what does it mean to hear the word of God? I think there's a couple things that, that are necessary. First, in our story today, I, I see Samuel had a hearing ear, right? God spoke and Samuel heard, or better, he listened, right? In Samuel's case, this was the first time that God had spoken to him. And it didn't matter. He heard him. But in your case, I wonder if you can like calculate how many gospel sermons you've actually heard. Can you count how many Bible passages that you've read and heard God speak to you? Can you number how many podcasts you've listened to that, that um, you've actually heard the voice of God speaking to you through that? We are not, we have no lack of, of, of hearing stuff, for sure. But are we listening? Pastor and preacher Charles Spurgeon told a story one time of a, a woman at his church in London who uh, opened her Bible, and he noticed in her Bible it was just marked up, like just notes everywhere, you know, words and phrases. And she uh, looked to... Pastor Spurgeon, and said, I hope that you think this is okay. I, I mean, this is the Word of God. I, I'm, I'm writing a lot of notes here. And Spurgeon said, I think it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And she said, you know what? Now that I think about it, Charles, what a responsibility to have heard so many sermons from such texts as these. What did she mean by responsibility? It means that she had heard God's word, and with that hearing came a holy obligation, a holy duty to live it out, all right? So whether it's a sermon or your own personal time in the word, your devotions, your, your podcast, what, like whatever intake you have as it relates to uh, a, a Bible, it's a great responsibility to read those things, um, I heard another story once, and I promise you this is, this is outside of our church. This didn't happen here. But uh, someone came to the pastor, and it was a ministry uh, that, that did Bible studies pretty regularly, and they said, uh, hey, um, here's the next book we want to study um, as a group. And for whatever reason, the pastor said to this person, um, I'm just curious, like with the last book that you guys studied together, how well would you say your group is living that out? And she kind of paused and thought, well, I don't really know. I guess we're, we really haven't taken the time to even have that conversation. We just kind of did the study and now we're moving on. He goes, I want you to think about stopping for a moment and reflecting on what you just read. And think about what it looks like to apply that to your life. And, and, and before you choose that next thing and, and move on to that next study, Consider, reflect how you can live out what you already know. 
be doers, right, of the word, not just hearers. How many times has God spoken to you? Can you count the times that you've heard God's still small voice when reading a passage of Scripture? Maybe it's in your own conscience that it's happened. Sometimes God speaks to us through our suffering, right? You've heard this quote before, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. That's how C.S. Lewis described the way sometimes that God speaks to us. Friend, know this, God is speaking. The question is, are you listening? Would you know his voice if you heard it? Here's Spurgeon again. If, if you were deaf, you might be excused for not hearing. But you have ears, yet you hear not. You could hear God's voice if you wish to hear it, but you are not willing. Your inability lies in your will, and that inability is the real obstruction. See, whether you hear God's call or not depends on the condition of your ears. Do you have a hearing ear? Samuel did. This leads me to the next thing that I think is it has to be in play for us if we're going to really hear from God, and it's this, a responsive heart, right? In verse 10, Samuel says, speak for your servant hears. That word hears is a, a word that means to hear with intent or to hear as to obey. And because Samuel had clean hands and a pure heart, he was able to hear God. And not only hear, just like hear God, but to respond to God as well. And when he says, here I am, that, that's, that's his like words of obedience. I know he was speaking them to Eli, but they really were a, 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 a response to whomever God was, or whomever was calling him, who was God, right? God was the one who was calling him. Reminds me of Isaiah's answer, right? He says, here I am, send me. We are called to not only hear, but to obey. To hear with an intent, to hear as to obey. It requires both a hearing ear and a responsive heart. Now, I want you to jump back to verse 15 real quickly. And I, I want you to notice something here that's significant for us. Samuel opens the doors of the house of the Lord to talk to Eli. Do you see that? Now, again, that may not seem like a big deal, but it's actually a very big deal. We alluded to this earlier, but Samuel has now been appointed as the nation of Israel's prophet. He is the new guardian of the door, right? Eli and his sons were not faithful. Eli fattened himself on the sacrifices, and because of his actions, he began to close the door on the fruitfulness of Israel. Eli's sons even dishonored the women who served at the door of the tabernacle. But Samuel now is going to attempt to bring honor back to the nation of Israel through honoring God and speaking for him. He's again, he's heard God and he's responding to God in obedience. And not only that, the mercy seat that sat atop the Ark of the Covenant, you can actually translate that to Deceit means word. In other words, the word was locked up in the tabernacle when the curtains and doors were closed. But when the doors were opened, when the priest would open the doors, the word would come out through the priest and bring life to the people. You could even say bring new birth to the people. Here's Lightheart again. The announcement of judgment that Samuel gives Eli was given at the beginning of a new day. Why? Because it announced the coming day of the Lord, the day that Hannah hoped for, when the nobles would be cast down and the needy exalted. Samuel opens the door so the word can go out. And from this moment, the word will go abroad to the people of God to bring new birth. 
Don't miss this. There is a dynamic motion happening in this chapter, a transition from wrath to grace, from judgment to blessing, and from barrenness to birth. Where God takes the initiative, right? We said the big theme theme of this book is that God works out his sovereign purposes in the world. He is taking the initiative to do that, to call a prophet, to bring the word out from the mercy seat where it's been locked up. In our story today, we see that Samuel would take the word of God to the people. He would dwell with them. He would mediate the scriptures to them wherever they were. The gospel of John says in chapter 1, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That phrase, dwelt among us, literally means, listen, tabernacled among us. In the Old Testament, the glory of God filled the tabernacle. And now John is saying the fulfillment of that, of that idea, and even what Samuel is going to do, and we see this at the end of our passage today and in the, in the weeks to come, is he is going to make the word flesh. He is going to, in the flesh, take the word of God to the people. But John is saying something even grander. Jesus, the Word, would become the flesh, entering the culture of man from the culture of heaven to tabernacle with us, to be the true and better tabernacle, to to dwell with us and bring himself the Word to us. And it's in Jesus, the Word, we find life, that we might not receive death. Life everlasting, actually. So, how is the Lord speaking to you? What has he asked of you? Can you say in all things to God, here I am? What is that thing that God has been leading you to do, to say, to act on that will bring honor to him? To let God know that you're not just hearing him, but you desire to obey him. Maybe it's a confession of sin. Maybe it's a decision that needs to be made in your life. Maybe for the betterment of your family. Maybe it's a debt to pay. Maybe it's a a dating relationship that needs to end. Or maybe it's a dating relationship that needs to begin. Maybe it's a call to the ministry, to the church, to the mission field. Whatever it is, friends, turn on your ears. And like Samuel, obey. Don't let the sun go down today without a step in obedience to what God may be saying to you. The scripture says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Step out in obedience for the sake of his name among all the nations. And let's say with Samuel, speak for your servant hears. God, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do, and I will do it for your glory. I will do it for your praise. Here I am. Let's pray together.